Welcome to the Cherry Hills Podcast. We're in a series studying the book of Jonah to help us fight the pull of apathy that keeps us from joining Jesus in his mission in the world. Thanks for being with us. As Jenny mentioned, we are going to continue this tradition as we've been going through the book of Jonah, a tradition that many churches have practiced for centuries where we stand to receive God's word. After she finishes, she will say, this is the word of the Lord, and we will reply by saying, thanks be to God. A reading from the book of Jonah, chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered in sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. The word of the Lord for the people of God. You may be seated. Forty more days in Springfield will be overthrown. Nothing? (laughs) Nope. No revival? I figured I'd start uh, that way, but apparently I'm going to have to keep preaching. So, Quick story, some of you have heard this before. When I was in high school, very shy young guy, and I got asked by my youth pastor to be a keynote speaker in front of over 200 other high school students. And because I was a good Christian, I agreed to do that, even though I was incredibly reluctant. And even leading up to the night of, I was begging them not to make me go out there and do that. But here's something I learned. Even though I was reluctant to go up there, if I hadn't said yes to that invitation, I would have missed one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And I'm sharing that for two reasons this morning. The first reason is we're just continuing our study in the book of Jonah together. And in this series, if you're following on your notes, here's what we're talking about. As his people, we must fight the pull of apathy in our mission. We talked about this way back on the first Sunday of August. Our vision here at Cherry Hills, if you want to get dug into our church, here's what we're about. We want to see every generation, every generation, giving themselves fully to the way of Jesus and to his mission. And the question is, what is his mission? Well, it's right there behind me on the banners, right? As disciples, we are to go into this world and make Jesus known. Now, I just want to remind you what I mean when I say apathy. This is something we've talked about. I'm not talking about laziness. When I use the word apathy, I'm talking about a lack of motivation, a lack of enthusiasm, a a lack of concern. As a quick side note, I do want to mention here, there are other forms of apathy that are caused through other means. That's not what we're talking about. Sometimes depression can lead to a medically kind of apathy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a spiritual apathy where we've sort of just lost our hunger, our heat, our desire to follow Jesus and to follow his command for us to go into the world. The reality is, you probably know this, that Christians in America are becoming more and more reluctant or apathetic to share their faith with others. 
You see somebody come to faith, they can't help but share this incredible thing, and then the longer we remain in our faith, we're sort of like, eh, I'm not sure I'm going to do that. In fact, LifeWay just did a study this April showing only 10% of evangelical Christians have a faith conversation with someone per month. So we're trying to fight against that pull. I see it in my life. It's so easy just sort of to forget about the mission Jesus has for all of us. Now, the second reason I share that story about myself is today, as we come to Jonah chapter 3, I've called this message the reluctant prophet. Because like many of us today in this country, Jonah did not want to go and speak to the Ninevites about God. He was extremely reluctant. We saw this in chapter 1. When God first called him, what did he do? He ran away. Here we go. He calls him again. Finally, he decides that he will go. And what we see is the greatest revival ever to take place in human history. The greatest revival, right? An entire city coming to faith in God. And friends, as I prayed about this week, as I prayed about this message, this is such a rich chapter, but I kind of wanted to frame it in that idea. What would it look like for a revival to take place in our city? What would have to be a part of that? What would it look like for a revival to take place in our church, in your home, in the heart of someone that you dearly love? Well, it can't happen unless God shows up. And we're going to learn that it's not going to happen because of the, unless the incredible mercy and compassion of God shows up. And friends, thankfully, that's what the entire book of Jonah is about. It is all about the mercy of God. So I was drawn to this question. How does revival happen? You can't manufacture it, but this chapter shows us what is necessary if God were to choose to show up in our midst this way. So with that, if you haven't already, I invite you, if you brought a Bible with you, turn it to chapter 3 of Jonah. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, we say it every week, we have copies of God's Word in the seat underneath you there in those black Bibles. You can find this on page 754 of those black Bibles. And if you don't own a Bible, if you're visiting us today, I'd love for you to take that home with you. We want you to have that as our gift to you. But we're going to kind of work our way through this text again with this framework is what would it look like if God chose to give us a revival? So Jonah 3, verse 1 starts this way. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now, would you read verse 3 out loud with me on your notes there? It says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Finally, right? This is an exact shadow of chapter one, the same exact thing that God asks him to do, where he runs away. This time, he finally obeys God. And if you're following on your notes, though reluctantly, Jonah finally obeys God and goes. It's kind of interesting. Essentially, this whole story starts over. How many of us have had that happen, where God has allowed us to start over? And friends, that's just another picture of the book of Jonah's main theme, God's incredible mercy. God gives Jonah a second chance to go and do what he asked him to do. That's called mercy. Now, what is mercy? We probably need a definition on the board here. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this definition if it's on your notes there. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. Now, this is different than grace. Grace is when God gives us something we do not deserve. So what's an example of this? Well, how about the cross? On the cross of Jesus, we just sang about what happened there. We're told that where the wages of sin is death, in his mercy, Jesus didn't give us what we deserved. He actually took it upon himself. And even better, in his grace, He has now given us things we could not possibly ask for. Adoption into his family. Daughters and sons of the king. New life, eternal life, pure hearts, and so much more. He went to the cross in mercy so that we would not get what we deserved. And in grace, he has given us so much more. And the book of Jonah is all about God's mercy. Friends, what did Jonah deserve for his disobedience? Judgment. He deserved to be cut off as one of God's prophets, right? What do the Ninevites deserve for being so evil and violent? Judgment. What do we deserve for our sin? People don't like to talk about this today. 
judgment. But instead, God is the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. And he, in his mercy, gives us those things we don't deserve. This is something, if you're sitting here this morning, I hope you come to understand about the gospel. Growing up, I didn't understand this. I thought I had to earn God's mercy by doing good things. That's called religion. And Jesus didn't like religion. He hated religion. What happens is when we live that way, we live under this constant pressure of shame and guilt and fear instead of understanding what the gospel is. Jesus took all of that from you, your guilt, your shame, and he put it upon himself. That's the gospel of Jesus, not religion. It's the gift of grace, the gift of mercy. It reminds me of, Jeff mentioned this last week. It's worth mentioning it again. I just think about this almost every day now that I've broken free from religion in my life. It's from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. Would you read this out loud with me there on the screen? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. How many of you need his mercy every morning? I sure know I do, and it's there for us, not based on what we've done for him, based solely on what he's done for us. So listen, if you're following on your notes, well, hold on, Jonah, sorry, this is why I have to write this stuff out, I'll just get ahead of myself, right? Jonah misses something that we can sometimes miss, though, that mercy isn't just for him. Jonah was happy to receive the mercy that God had just given him, a second chance, right? What Jonah continues to miss and what I can miss in my life is that God wants to show mercy to everyone. If you're following on your notes, God calls Jonah a second time because God desires to show mercy to all who are lost. I hope you hear this. Paul writes about this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. No one, nope, that's not the right verse, my bad. God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Do you hear that? All people to be saved. All people to be saved. But here's the question for us today. How does he do that? Anybody want to take a shot? How how does he make his mercy known to other people? Do you like that? Through you? Through me? To those who have received his mercy and grace, God says, go. Go into this world and share what you've been given with others. But like Jonah, let's be honest, sometimes we're pretty reluctant to do that. Sometimes we become apathetic about that. I don't know some of the reasons for you. I think reasons like fear, right? Fear is probably the biggest one. Fear of being embarrassed. Fear of not knowing what to say. Uh, fear of being shamed or, or I, I, I don't know where it stands. Or maybe like Jonah, you've just kind of lost your concern. You just think, let them do what they do, and I'll do what I do. Because we've lost the realities of heaven and hell and judgment and grace. I know it for me. I'll just tell you my honest opinion. When I go out on my day, when I go to the gym, when I go to the coffee shop, whatever, I'm just like this. I don't even think about it. It's not that I become apathetic. It's just not even on my radar for other people that this is the mission God has given to me no matter where I go. Now, the cool thing is Jonah wasn't the only one reluctant. I'm not the only one reluctant to share my faith. The Bible is full of people who are reluctant to share their faith with others. The people we put up on pedestals, right? Think about Moses begging God, please, I'm not good at speaking. Don't make me do this. Think about Elijah who's just like, I just want to die. We're done. I'm done. I can't keep going. Uh, Think about Peter denying his Lord three times, not feeling like he deserved to be restored to continue his ministry. Friends, this is the first thing I want to say to you about revival. Revival only happens when we go and share God's mercy with others. Paul puts it this way in Romans 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's incredible. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. That's the good news of God's mercy, right? Some of you have done that. 
For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be safe. That's the good news of the gospel. But here's the key. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Our role is to go into this world and share God's mercy with others. We all play a part, but that leads to the second thing that must be in place for a revival to happen. Let's pick it up in the rest of verse three. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Now, that probably means the surrounding areas as well. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. As a preacher, I'm just gonna tell you how much this annoys me. An eight-word sermon. Actually, it's only five words in Hebrew, and the entire city comes to faith. I mean, it's not even a good message, right? It's a terrible message. He doesn't even use an illustration. There's no biblical exegesis going on here. It's basically just doom and gloom. And I bet you, because he didn't even want to be there, he delivered it in a total monotone voice. So why was it so effective? Isn't that the, the question? How could an entire city believe this message? Well, it's pretty simple. Jonah's message, if you're following, was so effective because God was already at work. It wasn't a lengthy message. It didn't matter. It wasn't an intellectual message. It didn't matter. It wasn't an eloquent message. It did not matter. All that mattered was God said, go, and God had been working in these people's hearts before Jonah ever showed up. There can be no other explanation for this. Now, interesting, that word overthrown, if you've got your Bible there, interesting word, it actually carries with it the possibility of mercy. This is not lost on the Ninevites, nor is it lost on Jonah. Jonah knows that his message implies there is a chance, if they turn, that God will show them mercy, that God will forgive. This is exactly why he didn't want to go in the first place. It's why he fled in chapter 1. I don't want them to repent. I don't want them to experience mercy. That's God's desire for every person, that they might experience mercy. You and I, what's our role? We got to go and share. That's our job. That's what he's called us to do. But here's the truth. You have nothing. I have nothing in myself to make somebody come to faith. And that should be a relief. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to be an apologeticist. You don't have to use amazing illustrations. You just have to be you praying that the Spirit of God is already at work in the people's lives that he has put in your path. I love how Paul puts this. This church in Corinth is so messed up. All they cared about was whether they received their faith through Paul or through Apollos. And so they're arguing about which one was better. Paul writes, for one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? Who is Steve? What is Paul? Who is Brian? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it. But God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. What is our purpose? You guys don't got this yet. Okay. We're going to get there by the end of this series, right? Our purpose is to go and share God's mercy with others. What is our role? To go and share God's mercy with others. Understanding that only God can cause that to grow. You water. You plant. I water. I plant. Only God causes the growth. Have you ever experienced this before? Once in your life. I'll never forget many, many years ago, I was doing a message on friendship of all things, just talking about the need for us to have good, godly friends who sharpen us. And after the service, this young man came up to me crying, I need Jesus. I'm like, dude, I was talking about friendship. I didn't even talk about the gospel. And it was a great reminder to me, it makes no difference how I say what I say. If God is at work, he will move in the lives of people. This is by far the most important thing for a revival to take place. If you're following, revival only happens when the Spirit of God is working. 
Let's be clear here. This story is not about the Ninevites' faith. It is not about Jonah's incredible message. It is a story about the unbelievable truth that God cares enough for people to work in their lives and offer them mercy. But revival also requires a human response. Our role is to go and to share. What is our role? There we go. Good. The Holy Spirit's role is what? To convince people about what we're sharing. To convict, to inspire, to reveal to them the truth of the gospel. But at some point, a person must respond to the message of the gospel. And boy, do the Ninevites respond. Let's pick it up in the rest of verse 5 and see how they respond. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. And now, would you read verse 8 out loud on your notes with me from the New American Standard Bible? This is the most literal translation we can get of the Bible. It says... But every person and animal must be covered with sackcloth, and people are to call on God vehemently, and they are to turn each one from his evil way and from the violence which is in their hands. And then verse 9 finishes with this beautiful prayer. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Friends, what's our role? What's God's role? It's moving people's hearts. But if you're falling on your notes, it is every person's own responsibility to respond to the Spirit. You can't force that. I can't force that. And this is the mystery right here of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. In his mercy and grace, Jesus is clear. I want all people to come to me to know me, to receive my mercy and grace. Here is the gift for you. I'm offering it, but at some point, each individual person must say, I'm going to receive that. I take that gift. And the way we do that is what the Bible calls through faith and repentance. Faith and repentance. This was the message, first sermon Jesus preached in Mark 1.15. We looked at this about a year ago. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. What does it say? Repent and believe the good news. A lot of people believe in God still, we're told, in the United States. And what that means, I think, is intellectually they think, oh yeah, there's a God, there was a Jesus, he died. That is not faith. Faith is taking action, action through what is called repentance. And this is the third truth about if we want to see a revival. If you're following, revival only happens when there is genuine repentance. Now, I'm going to break down the repentance that the Ninevites did here because I think it can show us what takes place in revivals. The first thing we see is they put on, they fast and they put on sackcloth. Why? These are physical ways for them to demonstrate we are sorry for our sin. We know that we have done something wrong. We are grieving deeply. The biggest question in this chapter is what's with the animals, right? Why are they putting sackcloth on animals? Why are they making animals fast? Well, I think it's just a way to show this is how seriously we are taking this. Even the place we get our food from, we're asking them, those animals, to fast as well. Paul writes about this kind of, I don't know what to call it, like true repentance in uh, 2 Corinthians 7, starting in verse 8. He had written the Corinthians a letter in 1 Corinthians in 1 Corinthians, and they were hurt by it. And he writes, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurts you, but only for a little while, yet now I am happy. Why is he happy? Not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. What's the difference? Worldly sorrow says, I'm sorry that I got caught. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. 
That's what's taking place in the people of Nineveh here. If you're following, true repentance requires godly sorrow. Have you ever felt that deeply about what you've done against the Lord? This godly, deep sorrow. Second thing to notice about the repentance is that they turn from a specific sin. Did you see it in verse 8? They are repenting from what? Their violence. And this is exactly what the Ninevites were known for, the people of Assyria. They were a violent people, overthrowing nations and other people groups with no regard for their lives. This is exactly why God sent Jonah in the first place. Their stench is coming up to me. Their evil and violence has reached a boiling point. And they know this is exactly what they need to repent of. And still today, if you're following, repentance requires turning from specific sins. Whether it's sexual immorality, pride, selfishness, lack of love for Christian brothers and sisters, lack of love for those who are not like us in race or religion or politics, materialism, apathy, whatever it is, if you want to experience revival in our lives, if we all want to experience revival in this city and in this church, we don't repent in vague terms. I'm a master at this. Right? Lord, thank you for this day. Forgive me for my sin. And now I've got some stuff I want you to do in my life, right? No, we must clean out, so to speak, the straw or the relationship we have between us and Jesus. I mean, imagine taking your car to to get it fixed and say, my car's broken. Well, where? What's wrong? Well, I don't know. It's just broken. Fix it. No, they would need to know specifically where they're supposed to fix it. And in the same way, we must be specific about where we are hurting the Lord Finally, repentance requires calling on God vehemently. I love that. All right. Most of your translations probably say urgently. That's what Catherine read. But really, the Hebrew word here is much more violent. It reminds me of the prayer of the tax collector in the temple in Luke eighteen thirteen. You remember this? Read this out loud with me. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me. A sinner, that is vehement calling on the Lord. In seminary, I took a class on the history of revivals throughout the history of the church. And I got to tell you, one thing you will, you will learn is not one revival started without this kind of repentance taking place. This godly sorrow over sin. This vehement calling on God, knowing that he alone is the one that can come and give us a clean heart true sense of desperation and that's the desperation the Ninevites felt you see it in verse 9 who knows God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish who knows we can't control God we understand that if any change occurs though it's because of God's mercy that's true repentance a desperate seeking of God's mercy and thankfully that's exactly who god is he is a god of mercy that's the number one thing we see in the book of jonah in fact let's read verse 10 out loud on our notes here this is the most important verse in this entire book it says when god saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened if you're following god responds to our repentance with mercy God sees their sincerity. He has compassion. This is the primary attribute of God. He is a God of mercy. It doesn't mean God is not just. It does not mean he won't judge. It simply means his desire is to show every person mercy. As God says to the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 18, rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed. Get a new heart. And a new spirit, why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of everyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. The wages of sin is death. There is justice and judgment that must take place in this world if we can call God good. But ultimately, his desire is to give mercy to every single person. And right now, I'd be remiss to not remind you that this took place ultimately on the cross of Christ. 
He chose mercy over judgment once and for all. On the cross, the merciful God took the judgment you and I deserved so we can now receive mercy, not by what you do, but by what he has done. And so today, here's the good news for you. You don't have to live under the question the Ninevites ask. Who knows? Perhaps God will relent. Oh, no, friends. If you're falling on your notes, he did more than just relent. He bore our sin on himself. That's the gospel. That's what Alex is declaring when he gets baptized today. Jesus took my sin upon himself. He gave me mercy and grace. My favorite verse in scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it breaks this down beautifully. Paul writes, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. That's called mercy. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. That's called grace. He gives us what we don't deserve. Jesus bore our judgment. He became mercy. There is no longer any perhaps he will relent. He already has. He took what we deserve upon himself. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, no, it's too late for me. I've ruined my chance at mercy. I'm not a very good person. I'm just here to tell you, no matter how bad you think you are, God is always willing and ready to give a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and an infinity chance. If you're following on your notes, there is no one too far gone to receive the mercy of God. Amen? I mean, seriously, if the Ninevites can receive it, there is no one too far gone who can receive the mercy of God. And friends, this right here is how revival breaks out. People who have experienced this mercy, have you experienced this mercy? People who have experienced this mercy boldly going out into the world to share this mercy with others, praying and trusting not in themselves and their gifts and the way they speak, praying and trusting that the Holy Spirit is already at work ahead of you, not knowing all the answers. Maybe you'll be made fun of, but who knows? Who knows? Perhaps the Lord will be merciful and start a revival in that person's heart because of you. So friends, I'll ask you, here's the question. Will I go and share God's mercy with others and pray for revival? Our call is not to be reluctant or apathetic. Our call is to go into the world with faith, believing the spirit of God is still calling people to himself today. Would you pray with me? O oh, merciful and compassionate God, you have given us what we do not deserve. You have shown us mercy. And your call to us this morning is to show and explain by the way we live, by the words we speak, that same mercy to others. But we take a moment right now just to confess we're afraid to do that. We're reluctant to do that. We've become apathetic when it comes to sharing that with others. Before we take communion, we just spend some time confessing that to you. that you're bringing to our minds even right now. That we've been afraid to share with. Take away the fear that we won't know what to do or say. Thank you for the reminder today. It doesn't have to be fancy. have to know everything. We pray, even as we leave this place, that your spirit would be working in these lives that you're bringing our attention to, that you will meet us there, Lord. We want to be obedient and planting and watering, but we recognize this is only you can cause growth, so we rely on you for that. 
And now, Lord, as we prepare for communion, we cannot help but be grateful for the mercy you have shown us. That he who knew no sin became sin for me so that I might live in the righteousness of Christ. Together, we look forward to celebrating that. The good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this week's teaching. If you'd like more info on our church, you can visit our website or find us on Facebook.